Hi there, and welcome to this week's episode of Truffle Talks. I'm James Stephen, the editor of Truffle Report, and Truffle Talks is our new interview series where we sit down with the movers and shakers defining psychedelic business, policy reform, science, and culture. Joining us today is Kelsey Ramsden, CEO of MindCure Health, and we're going to talk about the Desire Project, which is MindCure's investigation into the use of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to treat hypoactive sexual desire disorder in women. Now, I think this is really important work, but before I go into why, I'm going to let Kelsey introduce herself and the project on her own. Kelsey, take it away. Thank you for the intro, movers and shakers. Always feels nice <laughs> to hold that. So, uh, yeah, of course, I'm Kelsey Ramsden. I'm the CEO at MindCure. And the Desire Project, I think it's important to, uh, right out of the gates note, it's called the Desire Project because there's really two component pieces. I think anytime we are tackling something that involves culture, as well as science, we have to do both. So I would say data moves the science and story will move the culture. And what we know about HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is a lack of sexual desire, is there's a, a bit of stigma around women talking about sex and desire, which I find um, interesting and, and not required, but, but that's the state that we find ourselves in. And when we look at the actual market growth that's predicted, it's meant to grow at 26% year over year over the next five years. And that's what is, not sorry? HSDD, the, the, wow. the diagnosis of HSDD, 26% growth year over year for five years to come. But that's not because more women are all of a sudden lacking in desire. It's because more women are showing up to say, hey, there's something wrong. Right. They're talking about it. The and mental health conversation around this issue is evolving. A hundred percent. So that's why it's the desire project. It's both sides. It's mm-hmm. of course advancing the research and having these kind of conversations to talk about how demographics are changing and the gals who are coming up aren't really standing for all the drugs being pointed at the fellas uh, and, and not talking about our own interest in sexuality and desire. So That's a bit of an intro to the project and why it's called a project. And then in simple terms and shortly, just as you mentioned, it's MDMA with psychotherapy. So I I think everyone in the psychedelic atmosphere is pretty familiar with the MAPS Mm -hmm. protocol and the work that MAPS has done. And so if they imagine it not dissimilar, but in that the psychotherapy is different because it's targeted at a different indication. Okay, so backing up just a step. Why is desire such a crucial component of healthy sexuality and mental health? Great. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> just parse this whole sexual conversation into mm. a few pieces. So what most of us focus on is resolution, orgasm, the big, you know, fireworks yeah. show at the end. And that's what we call um, the goal. Yes. But I might invite a different part of the conversation, mm. which is Prior to this, you know, fireworks show, there is arousal. And prior to arousal, there is desire. Mm -hmm. So if we might allow ourselves the notion that it's kind of a stepped process, you really don't get to orgasm without going through a few steps along the way. And as we all know, being adults, you drop off at some of those steps along the way if things aren't going the way that you had thought they might. Mm -hmm. But it all starts with desire. Every single incidence that ends in this fireworks show starts with the first step. And desire doesn't have to involve anyone else. Desire can be something for the people who are unpartnered, who are exploring their sexuality. Desire can be thoughts of fantasy. So this is the beginning of the big show. So why does why does desire matter to our mental health is predominantly because sexual health is a part of mental health. Like anybody who's had a good run of an intimate relationship knows you just simply are more mentally charged up, mentally Mm -hmm. well. You feel more whole and connected to self and other. So it's to me a bit of a like, of course. Um, But we don't think about it that way because again, we, it's this weird thing. We're just, we're just animals. We're a species, but we somehow want to parse out the sexuality pieces, not being a part of our human experience. It's like some other 
thing. There's a lot of taboos there. I would say that we're still coping with that. We want to separate it from the whole of our experience. Like, no, no, it's just this thing that happens in private. It's not something that affects the rest of our lives and mental health, but it very much does. It does. Like, let's just call it what it is. It just absolutely Mm -hmm. does. And I don't think there needs to be any shame in that. Like we all exist because someone in your case, maybe 35 years ago, in my case, 45 years ago. But in cases many years before that, 31, thank you. 31, there you go. Not not, not an offensive mistake, but I'm just saying 31. (laughs) Someone, (laughs) hopefully two people, experienced desire. Is that so wrong? It's totally great. Um, And yeah, I just kind of can't quite figure out why we're not at the place where we can just talk about this. in very basic terms, it's a part of being human. Okay, well, I guess that kind of leads into my second question. I think um, historically and in contemporary science, female sexual health and wellness is frequently neglected by mainstream medicine. Um, Why is it so important for mind cure to get this right in psychedelics? Like, is this, uh, this this feels like something that is is really crucial, but that no one else has uh, taken a look at yet? So I'm I'm going to stray into the arena where maybe I shouldn't stray, but that's okay. I like to be a bit mm-hmm. candid. Um, yeah, when things are hard, people tend to not want to do them. When there's taboo associated, it seems easier to do something that's easier, right? right? <clears throat> yes. And for my own self, I see it quite the opposite. I think the greatest opportunity is in doing things that you're uniquely positioned to do that may be harder for other folks to try their hand at. So when I, where there is the greatest risk. Yeah, there is the greatest reward. And, and uh, in basic terms, you know, we're a drug development company and there aren't any other psychedelic focused drug development companies that are led by a woman. And I can have this conversation all day. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, in a really basic terms, that makes sense. But secondarily to your point, like why is it that, that it hasn't been a focus like women's sexual health hasn't. And I, I am going to go against the grain here. And then I think most people might like the easier answer, which is, Oh, the fellas were in a room strategically, you know, we want better erection. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it happened. Yes, we didn't discover the female orgasm until the 90s, maybe. It's just speaking from <laughs> right, my... Yeah, when, when Harry met Sally, everyone yeah. went, wait a minute. What, no, but what, I mean, that, what is that I, noise I, she's making? It seems to be repeatable. Yeah. That, that, uh, <laughs> that, Taking notes here. That's um, Viagra was a plan B. Viagra was a heart drug. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that in the research, these fellows were coming back who were in the studies and going, there's like this other kind of thing tends to be. So in fairness to the fellows in in any given room and all the drug development that's gone before us, I I don't think that there has been a, um, you know, specific intent to say, never mind the women. Mm -hmm. It's just been that to date, the things that have fallen off the lab bench, as it were, have benefited men. And, And that's how I see it. Um, It would be, you know, easier societally to create a men versus women narrative. But I don't think that's the case. I think everybody's for orgasms. I don't think men are like the women should not have any pleasure at all. I think actually the notion of women wanting it more is really appealing to men. Hmm. Um, I mean, I would hope that other breed is dying off at this point. I think they are. Well, and I think that's part of the reason that we're seeing this Mm -hmm. uptick in the size of this market is that men are going, yeah, I'm willing to listen to this conversation. Yes, Mm -hmm. this is a real thing. Yes, that's been my experience, too. I would also go back and just in in terms of your uh, as a drug developer, where there is risk, there is reward. I would say that as a journalist covering psychedelics, the least interesting thing to me right now is just another small market cap psychedelic drug developer. Like we are interested in psilocybin for depression. Just there's there's something like a hundred of them. Uh, So I appreciate from the standpoint of, you know, having something to write about and talk to people about on this show that you are trying something interesting. Thank you, sir. Well, I mean, in early days, 
the good old MBA in me just got out a, you know, get out your Excel spreadsheet. Who's doing what? How many yep. of them are there? What's the likelihood of success? Where can we play? What are our advantages? What makes the most sense? And and I also like to think about two other things. One is what's a de-risked program? Hmm. What do we know anecdotally works in the world? And MDMA is called the love drug. It's not called the sex drug. Again, we're not having all these amazing orgasms on MDMA, but we are finding more interest yes. in attraction and connection to self and other, which is desire. Mm -hmm. And then the well, that's something part, that's sorry, go ahead. No, no. Uh, um, the second part is also this idea of like, what's the next molecule to money. And for us, you know, and I think most of the market agrees, it's likely MDMA. And um, so when you get this kind of convergence, the good old Venn diagram, again, mm -hmm. basic MBA 101 mm -hmm. stuff, it seems like a, a, a fall off your kind of chair moment where you can't help but not advance the program. Okay, so just going going back a, a step again. So I, it, it is the love drug and I don't have any, you know, I don't think anyone who has any familiarity with MDMA has any difficulty envisioning that it can be used for this. In fact, um, one of the very first written interviews I did here for Truffle Report uh, was with a gentleman named Dr. George Greer. Are you familiar? He's the one of the senior, one of the heads of the Hefter Research Institute who got yeah. his start as a contemporary of uh, Alexander Shulgin and a few of those other you know, luminaries uh, and who had initially begun you know, synthesizing MDMA before it was scheduled and using it as, among other things, a couples therapy drug uh, down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the anecdote he told me, which I love, is that his patients were, you know, these big, tough Southwestern cowboys who had never had an intimate conversation with their wife in their life, their wives in their entire lives, and were, you know, able to open up on their couch and the on the interest of this. So I would say, you know. It's, it might not just specifically be desire, but intimate communication is certainly a component of that and important behind that science. So it's always it's always kind of been there if you go back and look at it. Totally agree. And this idea too, that we can even go one step back from our communication with other, which is in the couple therapy, and we know it helps people open up, but the connection to self, like the ability to actually connect to, you know, these big cowboys, Lots of times you don't even connect to yourself or your own clarity about who you are and what you want. And that's the beginning of being able to communicate that. And MDMA does that so tremendously well. So, you know, it's our thesis that that's going to help women connect to themselves and then others and so on and so forth. Um, I think if you give me just one second, I want to, pause for the listener really quickly around this kind of hypersexualization of the word desire. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people to automatically go to like women in stockings. You know, I, I, I would like to invite this idea of you can think about someone that you've been attracted to uh, fully clothed on any given Tuesday afternoon when they just looked at you a certain way and they were magnetic. Yes. That's desire. Mm -hmm. So I, I also think that that form of desire is probably the most powerful, right? Like everybody can think of that thing. And, and we can also think of, you know, some porn or whatever the case, but yes. we think about that. Our Freudian viewers are just having right? a, a field day right now. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> But that look is something that every woman should have access to. That so deep connection to self and desire that it doesn't matter what she's wearing or what. Without day being hypersexualized. Yeah, because that's. I mean, everybody loves that other piece uh, too. Maybe not everybody, but that's mm. not what we're talking about. Mm. That's you know, that's the later down the road piece. Right. Um, we're talking about the idea that you could get to later down the road that it starts with. <laughs> that a lot of people are just closed off from. Totally. So it doesn't even have to be that scary of a conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know. Okay. Well, speaking of scary conversations, why don't we get, uh, you know, MDMA <laughs> as, as the love drug, but also as a club drug, as something that, sure. you know, as, as 
recreational chemicals go is not the riskiest out there, but does still have some actual concerns and stigma attached to it. Um, and, you know, we've mentioned maps already in there and their work and obviously doing, they're obviously doing good things there to prove to people that it can be used this way. But what, you know, what are you encountering? Uh, what, how, what obstacles are you having to overcome to get this work done? So I think there is the statement I always love to make, which is upon map shoulders, we stand and we mm-hmm. always want to give, you know, a little hat tip to all of the people over there who've done all this work to really lay a lot of ground for all of us. I don't care if you're in psilocybin game or the MDMA Mm -hmm. game. And then the kind of the second piece is thank heavens. They learned a lot of tough lessons for our benefit. It's a little bit like having an older brother who helps you understand how to get back into the house when you're past curfew is this idea of how do we hold this work in a therapeutic container that really protects people who are in some of their most vulnerable states. Mm -hmm. And when we look at this indication, we do see a a, a segment of it who are people who have experienced negative sexual interactions. And we see a segment of people who have been diagnosed, who have material issues with um, body image, et cetera. And, and so learning from how MAPS has adapted their protocol over time to have the two therapists, to have you know clear lines of communication, to ensure that this container is safe is important for us. Uh, and so we'll be going down that same path and then investigating some other technologies that we could lay over top of it to give people even more assurance um, and, and kind of more compliance to the protocol to ensure that everything is executed safely and it doesn't make its way out the back door to the local rave. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is always a risk and, you know, kind of the reason we're in the situation we're in with psychedelics in the first place. And again, harking back to my conversation with Dr. Greer, uh, he's a, he's a lovely old gentleman. And what he told me was, you know, as soon as we started studying MDMA, we knew that it was going to get scheduled. It was too good not to be, you know, making its way out the back door to the parties. So I think just being conscious of that and knowing what we know now uh, gives us a better handle on the situation. Uh, But I would like to talk, um, say a bit about the timeline for execution and studies and, you know, what you hope to get out of this in terms of say novel molecules, patented, patentable technologies, things like that. Great. So If everything goes according to plan, we should be into the research in Q2, 2022. Mm -hmm. In advance of that, we're launching what I think is going to be the largest um, survey across the indication, globally getting women's perspectives and really driving a lot of insight. Because we don't want to just like do a clinical research program that then can't be deployed into practice. We want to really understand the constraints so that we can dev it out so it's a commercial success. And then when we talk about novel molecules, um, you know, there's nothing announced. But as everyone knows, protecting IP around MDMA is challenging. Yes. And we have some ideas about that that um, are advancing. And on the technology piece, yeah, I mean, We have the digital therapeutics tool, which is a large component of our business. And to me, it only makes sense that concurrently, we also develop a protocol within the within the technology that we can overlay to help, again, ensure compliance, but also get better patient outcomes so that um, we have the data set to proof it. And hopefully, you know, unlock insurance payment, which is the Mm -hmm. big goal, which gets is everybody's big goal. That's it's, right. it's kind of the it's kind of the holy grail that we're all headed for. I mean, again, speaking for the psychedelic journalism side of things, uh, around MDMA and psilocybin and a few other compounds, we fully expect to see a knockdown drag out over IP. So we wish you the best of luck there. Um, Godspeed, sir. Godspeed. Yes. Uh, but just with that in mind, what would you consider a successful result? And obviously, you know, we mentioned the iStream, the digital therapeutics to, therapeutics tool. But how do you take that result to market? How uh, you know? Can you be more specific about how MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy for sexual desire uh, fits into MindCure's overall business strategy going forward? 
And then we're going to talk a little bit about clinics too, I guess. Okay, sure. Let's get, let's run the gauntlet. Yeah. So yeah. I think when you look at the value chain on drug dev and deployment, we start with owning a drug, of course, and there's mm. value. And then there's- IP comes with, first. Right, IP first. And then there's training the therapists who are going to deploy. And then there's owning the distribution system for the drug and the therapy. And then there's owning the clinics uh, or the therapists at which, you know, these things would be deployed. So with respect to MDMA as a straight up standalone, obviously no one will own MDMA. So um, there are some, you know, ways to look at novels that could be helpful in that regard. The second piece is, of course, because we're designing the training protocols and the paradigm, we have to train the trainer. So there will be a segment of our, you know, of our revenue stream that's training people. And then not that we will have clinics, but we will have centers of excellence where these people will come to train and we'll be deploying the the, um, the care ourselves. And then on the distribution thing, of course, the digital therapeutics comes in there where we can distribute the protocol to other therapists. Ideally, and thank again, thanks to MAPS, there will be an ecosystem that we will arrive at that already has a lot of MDMA trained therapists that will probably be looking for other indications to serve their clients, mm-hmm. not just PTSD. Expanding right now. Expanding right now. So th- that's kind of the, the value chain. So we can pick up on the distribution. We can pick up on the training. We can pick up on some of the centers of excellence, otherwise known as clinics, but we're not planning on owning a thousand clinics. No. Um, You're not going to be franchising this. No. I mean, we will franchise the training in a way yes. that you know, you're a mind cure certified therapist um, for HSDD. And then, of course, you can script against it. But, you know, um, anyone in their right mind would have to be thinking about what comes next, because there is only a period of time that the label patent will protect you. And then at such time, you better have um, a second thing. And, of course, that's a part of the strategy is developing the market, being first to it, owning the space and the mind share, and then coming in with something that might be... um, easier to protect it for a much longer term. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so I, next. Mm-hmm. okay well, next. well, I mean, what I, what I really wanted to sort of close on um, is just a, an important issue that we've touched on quite a bit here at Truffle Report. And that is, you know, make, makes the rounds in the, in the rest of the psychedelic space every so often. And that is, Patient safety, particularly the really unfortunate issue of sexual assault in by psychedelics practitioners, because this is, again, very unfortunately, something that happens to vulnerable patients. Um, Seen a bit of it, uh, a bit of reporting around it, uh, particularly for ayahuasca ceremonies and just given you know, issues of accountability in the space and the level of vulnerability of therapists and patients in psychedelic therapy, you know, what does a clinic doing these things, particularly for a a vulnerable issue like sexual desire, where someone seeking treatment for this might conceivably have trust issues around these topics already? How, how, what does this look like? What, what, safeguards are introduced there yeah this always just is sad isn't it that no it is it is but it's something i feel obliged to ask whenever no, I'm glad we're talking about therapy in a in a setting like this because I'm people the there is even in conventional psychotherapy uh if if there is such a thing we we see a a lot of vulnerability in patients. There's a lot of potential for inappropriate therapist patient relationships. Uh, There's dependent, there's emotional dependency, there's manipulation, there's, uh, there's bonding. And with psychedelics, the potential for all of that is amplified. Yeah. um, So I, obviously our team has been spending a lot of time talking about this very thing. And one of the stats that was shared with me was 7% of of therapists behave in this kind of way, like generalized therapy, as mm-hmm. you're mentioning. And um, that's too bad, obviously. And to your point, it becomes amplified when people are even that much more, you know, when our default mode network is downgraded, even that much more. So our sense of fight or flight is minimized in a way that some of that just 
like internal pinging that what I call the street smarts is just kind of dialed down a bit. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think it's important for every one of us who are involved in the space to make sure that we have like open and easy access to whistleblower policies, not at the corporate level, but at the like deployment level. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that information that people share is actually addressed and isn't kind of I've been reading some things lately about people who've brought concerns and it's been, oh, you know, kind of um, waylaid or said that that's just a part of the process and you could feel those things. And and I think taking every single every single situation seriously um, is important. And then I also feel like, you know, it because of our digital therapeutics technology, we are in the position to overlay additional resources where, like for example, um, with our ketamine for depression, there's an SOS button built in. So if you're at a clinic and you're no longer in the care of your therapist, whatever the case, you can SOS and that goes to the clinic and to, you know, in your local jurisdiction. And I, I think the same thing, could be applied to this type of program where there is an, you know, um, a blinded to the therapist mm -hmm. opportunity for a patient to say something doesn't sit right. And it doesn't have to be that this has gone wrong. It's also this idea of inviting people into an escalated conversation that doesn't have to start all the way up here. It can start with, there was a moment of discomfort and I want to mm -hmm. understand um, because I often, I also think that part of this conversation that's challenging is we only get to it or we only report when uh, it's a nine one one. When it's a nine one one, there's it, no yeah. We need we need a bit more of an escalating saying an escalating scale of discomfort to better understand individual patients' personal boundaries. Okay, that's I think that's an excellent answer. Um, well, it's. It's kind of the way that I see it because we yeah. are all different and our own tolerances are very different, you know, and, and our own triggers are different. And that's totally. going, and that's going to absolutely be the case specifically with something like desire where everyone uh, has their own, you know, emotional makeup for their sexuality, where we, absolutely. where we have different triggers and different traumas. Absolutely. And we have all sorts of different gender biases and gender identity. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a rich field, a great of, deal of unpacking. Yeah. There's a, there's a bit of work to do, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, bodes well for the program and does demand of us a greater level of intention, which is, you know, part of the reason for the big survey in advance of it too, was really, really deeply understand, not just, you know, the indication, but the experience of it and what this means to people um, so we can thoughtfully deploy it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm very happy to leave it there, but Kelsey, as we wrap up, I will give you the last word. The last word. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah. we might've missed, not touched on anything else you want people to know about the desire project. I think the only thing I would want people to know is that it's an invitation to a conversation. You know, of course, it's a stock and it's a drug mm -hmm. research program and it's all these things that are typical. Um, but one thing I, I think that we at MindCare definitely stand for is a culture of openness and a culture of engagement. Mm -hmm. So if people are curious about, like, what does this mean for me? Or I'm a person who suffers from it. Or I think maybe my wife has it, but she's not telling me or whatever the case. Um, we want to have this be an open dialogue because like I opened with, it's a project. And we'll do the drug research, but we also want to advance the culture. So happy to engage in all of those conversations. Okay. Well, thank you for saying so. And thank you for being here. Uh, once again, this has been Kelsey Ramsden of Mind Cure Health talking about the Desire Project. I'm James Stephen, the editor of Truffle Report. Thanks for watching.